Good morning. How are we doing? Awesome. I got thumbs up. Thank you, Carrie. It's good. We are walking through a series on the book of Matthew uh, right now. And uh, before Easter, we were talking about Jesus as king. And since Easter, we've uh, kind of dove back into Matthew to see what uh, impact, how that changes the way that we live. And I understand that we do not live uh, currently in a kingdom. We live in a democratic republic. But in a kingdom, particularly in uh, the medieval era or in the ancient times, the further away you got from where the king was, the less of his rule and order and control permeated the kingdom. So if you lived on the fringes of the kingdom, it's a little shadier. It's a little more outlaw. It's a little more, uh, there's the rule and reign doesn't, doesn't quite extend that far. And so you might begin to think that maybe the king doesn't care about your life. You may think that the king doesn't really concern himself with what goes on in our little corner of the world. You may also think that the king maybe isn't even there. Because there were rumors that would, would filter throughout the kingdom. Somebody could spread a rumor that the king was assassinated or the king died. And you'd have no way of knowing whether or not that was true. So I hope you see where I'm going with this. Many of us struggle with doubts. It has been 2,000 years since Jesus walked this earth, since he was raised from the dead. 2,000 years. Not spatially, but chronologically, we are on the fringes of the kingdom. It's a long way out from that. We can begin to ask the questions, does Jesus really care about us anymore? I mean, look at all the things that are happening on the news, all the bad things that are happening. Does Jesus care? Does he not see? Does he not want to interrupt this? Does he just care about me personally? Is he even there? Does he even notice me? You see, all of us at some point or another will wrestle with doubts. They will become obstacles to our faith. They'll get in the way of us perhaps trusting in Jesus. And there'll be great, great challenges. And what they do is they make us feel like we're the only ones who have these doubts. We're the only ones who feel this way. Everybody else, just look around the room. Everybody's really nicely dressed. Very lovely this morning. Great job. But you can sit there and look around the room and be like, wow, all these people, nobody, nobody struggles with faith. Nobody has a problem like I have a problem. So we're going to talk today about doubts and how our faith can be reconciled with them. By looking at a story that we've already read, it's Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. It's the story of the Canaanite woman. And we're going to see what our faith needs to acknowledge, what it needs to endure, and how it needs to overcome. So first, faith acknowledges opposition. Faith acknowledges opposition. Verse 21 of chapter 15. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Okay, so Jesus is retreating from a Jewish area into a Gentile area. And the reason why he's doing this is he has just had an encounter with the religious leaders about purity rules and cleanliness laws and all this stuff, and he's taking a break. He's like, I'm, I'm done for a while. I'm going to go into a Gentile region where they won't follow me so that we can all take a breather. How many of you have had the, the phantom bathroom break when you have toddlers and you're like, I just got to go somewhere where they can't get me. So I'm going to the bathroom, right? Yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about. That's what this is. Jesus is taking a break. And it's important because after this period is over, in Matthew 16, 21, he's going to start his journey to Jerusalem for the last time, the final encounter with the religious leaders. Now, at the same time, in this region, there's this Canaanite woman from Syrophoenicia, and she has a daughter who is unwell, demon-possessed. And it says that the child is severely oppressed. Now, we don't know specifically what this entails. There's not details on it, but we do know that oppressed typically means something physical. So there's physical manifestations of what this demon is doing to her. 
And we also know that the word severely means it's very intense, which probably means the demon's trying to harm her or even outright kill her. So some things you see in the Gospels is the, the, the demon can throw somebody into fire to burn them or into water to drown them. It looks like seizures. And so this woman is so concerned for her daughter, she then goes into the wilderness because she knows Jesus, this guy she's heard about, is somewhere out there in the wilderness, and I'm going to go find him. I'm going to go bring him back, and he's going to heal my daughter. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. But this woman is desperate to find help. And we know she's desperate because of who she is. She's a Canaanite woman. Now, this is a term you don't see very often in, in the New Testament. You see it a lot in the Old Testament. Because the Canaanites were the people that lived in the promised land before the Israelites got there. They were the ones that the Israelites drove out. So imagine that this, this age-old enemy of the Jews is now seeking out Jesus, their Messiah, for help. Can you imagine? This doesn't make sense. She's so desperate, she's seeking out somebody from a group of people that tried to wipe out her entire people. That's how desperate she is. And hopefully you see how God's providence is leading these two groups of people together, Jesus and this woman but hopefully you also see how many obstacles this woman has to overcome, how many doubts, how much opposition she has in confronting Jesus and getting the help that she needs. There are racial obstacles. We just talked about them. Canaanite versus Jew. There's political obstacles. The Messiah is the leader of her enemies. You wouldn't go seek out the leader of your enemies for any kind of help at all. There are gender obstacles. He's a man, she's a woman. In that day and age, especially with him being a Jewish man, it's not okay. They were treated poorly. They were looked down upon in that day and age. There's geographical obstacles. Jesus isn't out there with the sign being like, hey, I'll do some miracles, just come send everybody here, you know? He's not notifying people of where he's at. She has to find him. She has to seek him out. There's spiritual obstacles, clearly, this is a strong demon, and clearly this woman has only heard reports of what Jesus can do. Maybe Jesus can't do anything. Maybe this demon is too strong. Maybe Jesus can't handle him. And then there's social obstacles. Jesus travels with an entourage. Maybe she won't even get to see him. And hopefully, you'll see all the obstacles that you run into as well. When you approach Jesus, we run into obstacles too. We run into things that make us doubt. We have intellectual obstacles. You may be somebody that believes the Bible, but at the same time, you understand that science sometimes says things that seemingly contradict what the Bible says. Is it seven days? Is it literal seven days? Is it a million years? What is it? We have intellectual obstacles that we have to wrestle with, right? We have philosophical obstacles. We constantly see on the news how bad things are. God, are you going to do something? Why would a good God let such evil happen? We have cultural obstacles. God is a God of love. We live in a society now where it's very affirming. We want equality, right? Well, God, why do you care who loves who? Why can't people just love each other? Why can't love be love? Why do you care? It's a cultural obstacle. We have psychological obstacles. Struggle with depression or anxiety or fear or worry. You have spiritual obstacles. Sometimes it feels like God's not even there. Not to mention obstacles from your past, maybe things you're ashamed of. Obstacles from your community, maybe church hurt that you're holding on to. Maybe obstacles from your career. You want to climb the ladder. You think maybe somehow Christianity gets in the way of that. I don't know. But for many of us, what you feel like you've been taught is for you to embrace faith and for you to grow in your faith, it means you push down the obstacles, the doubts. You push them down, you ignore them, and you push forward. You bury your head in the sand. You think childlike faith is not acknowledging the doubts. It's not acknowledging the worries. It's not acknowledging the opposition. It's just pretending like they don't exist. And I'm going to press forward. That's not faith. That's fantasy. That's what that is. 
Faith doesn't offer us rose-colored glasses. Faith doesn't paint this picture that ignores some of the problems with faith. That's not what real faith is. Real faith, the kind of faith that'll rescue you, deliver you, that'll lead you to Jesus every time, is a faith that fights. It battles, it struggles, it wrestles. It acknowledges the tensions. It acknowledges that sometimes there aren't always clear-cut answers. It acknowledges that there's some things in this world that we wish were different. That's what real faith is. And so we have to acknowledge that there are real problems, that there are real things we struggle with. This is what this woman does. This is what this woman is doing. She doesn't just look at her situation and say, oh, well, daughter's got a demon. Guess I'll do the laundry. Oh, well. No. She acknowledges the problem, but then what does she do with it? She takes it to Jesus. And this is what we have to do as well. You can't just acknowledge it and and state reality and be like, yep, there's problems, oh well. No, you've got to bring it before the Lord and say, Father, what, what is this? Why is this happening? Why have you allowed this to go on? Why do I feel this way all the time? Where are you? What are you doing? And then we can take it to other people. Because again, when you struggle with doubt, when you struggle with opposition, it can feel like you're the only one that does this. So you have to take it to other believers. And say, hey, I'm really struggling with some doubts right now. And then guess what? When you share it with your small group, your connect group, friends, mentors, brothers and sisters in Christ, guess what happens? You realize that, oh, I'm not the only one that wrestles with doubt. Now, I might be the only one that wrestles with this particular kind of doubt, but I'm not the only one who struggles with it, with doubt myself. Now, I wish just acknowledging the doubts would like make them go away. You know, like where you can write something on a piece of paper and then light it on fire and it just, you know, symbolically disappears. That's not necessarily how it works. Real faith has to actually put up with it. So faith also endures opposition. It acknowledges the opposition, but it also endures it. Look at verse 23 and see the challenges that this woman goes through. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away for she is crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now you would think Jesus, knowing everything, knowing what this woman has gone through, he would commend her faith. Wow, how cool it is that you've gone all this way, you've traveled all this way, you're struggling, you're clearly hurting, great is your faith, you're healed. Your daughter's healed. That's not what happens. In fact, the opposition increases before it gets easier. It increases. It starts with Jesus not answering her. No response. This woman's approach to Jesus is perfect. She calls him Lord, which may be just like master. It could also be like God. And then she says, son of David. She recognizes his role. He's the Messiah. This is a confession of faith. And it gets her nowhere. Silence. How many of you have prayed to the Lord and gotten nothing? Silence. Stillness. Like he's not even there. But then, it's okay. She's got some people there that might help her out, the disciples, but what do they say? God, send her away. So annoying. This woman just keeps calling out for us. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wow, the disciples are big jerks. And they are, but they're not actually wanting to send her away without giving her what she wants. That's not what's going on. They're telling Jesus, Jesus, would you please heal this woman, do whatever she wants so she'll leave us alone, which again, not super compassionate, but there we are. She's an inconvenience to them. She's in the way of their rest and relaxation, their program. They're on a program right now and she's holding them back. When Jesus actually speaks, you would think Jesus is going to set everything straight. Not so much. He just says, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's it. Like, I'm not going to this person. I'm not supposed to be involved here right now. Now, what he's talking about is God's plan to expand 
the mission of the kingdom, the gospel, out to the different groups of people. So it starts with the Jews, then it moves to the Gentiles. And Jesus is saying, we haven't gotten there yet. Yet. But this does not deter her. None of it deters her. She bows before him. She throws herself down and desperately chokes out, Lord, help me. You can sense the desperation. And Jesus says probably one of the most difficult things that Jesus has ever said. Maybe. I don't know. It is not right to take the bread from the children and give it to the dogs. Now what he's talking about here is the privileged place of the Jews in comparison to the unprivileged place of the Gentiles. Gentile dog was a common uh, insult. Now I know some of you have probably heard that the word for dog here in the Greek is like this pet name. It's an endearing term. It's not like dog like you would call a stray. It's more like puppy or something. That's true. The word is that way. But the tone is not one of, this is nothing short of, I don't want to say it's an insult, but it is nothing short of Jesus telling this woman, we both know what our relationship is here. You know how the Jewish people view you. Now, we don't know the tone other than kind of what I just described, but we don't know if Jesus is doing a tongue-in-cheek thing here. We don't really know, but I'll say this. If you want to know how offensive this is, just sometime this week, call somebody a dog. And not in like a fun way, where they're like, oh, yeah, you know, like, I got a hole in one. Oh, you dog. No, uh-uh. Try it with your spouse. See how that works out for you. <laughs> and Travis's marital counseling went up 200%. This is nothing short of Jesus saying exactly what every Jewish rabbi would say to her. And if you're not seeing your own journey with God here, I'm either not painting this picture well at all, or this is your first day in church. Because every single one of us at some point have prayed and felt like we were not heard. At some point, the people that we go to church with have hurt us, just like Jesus' disciples hurt this woman. And at some point when we've gone to Jesus with something, we felt like he looked at us and was like, what do you want now, you dog? Every single one of us. Sometimes they happen isolated incidents. Sometimes it happens one right after the other. Sometimes you feel like it all at once. Somehow God doesn't hear me and he thinks I'm a dog. And the people of God aren't helping at all. You need to hear today that your doubts and your struggles and those problems don't make you an outsider. They make you one of us. You fit right in, at least with me. But you have to endure them. You have to endure those obstacles. That's what makes you an insider. That's what makes the difference between a long time serving follower of Jesus Christ and somebody who only does that when it feels good, when it's working for them. Because the long time suffering servants of Jesus Christ put up with that. They endure it. They go through with it. And what God wants to do with that, the reason why you have to endure these doubts and obstacles and burdens and all that, the reason why we have to endure that is because of what God wants to do in your life. He wants to strengthen your faith. And one of the ways you get stronger is to carry something for a long period of time. How many of you are familiar with isometric training? Okay, so isometric training is where you uh, take and hold a position for an extended period of time. So like planking. Planking is a form of isometric training. Or uh, lifting like dumbbells above your head, that's a form of isometric training. Uh, all that stuff, piggyback rides, things like that. It's all sorts of stuff. Piggyback rides, yes, they can be qualified as isometric training. And so what happens is you are given these burdens, you're given these obstacles, you're given these doubts and these feels, and you have to carry them for a long period of time, and God is using them to strengthen your faith, saying that even in the midst of this, do you trust me? Do you trust me? He can take neutral things or even bad things like church hurt and say, do you trust me in the midst of this despite what's going on? It's to make your faith strong, durable, able to handle challenges. That's what it's there for. 
If, you, if your faith is never challenged, how is it ever going to be strong enough? How are you ever going to know if it's strong enough? Because what if, when you really need it, your faith fails you? Because it's never been challenged. You've never known what to do with it. So how do we deal with this? How do we deal with the fact that Jesus has become our personal trainer? And he's given us burdens to carry. Well, first, we have to submit to Jesus' plan. Submit yourself to Jesus' workout regimen. This is what the woman does. Despite all opposition, she still bows before him and says, Jesus, help me. I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. This is the difference between strengthening your faith and just becoming a stronger person, okay? We don't need stronger people in the church. I don't, we, we certainly don't need more stubborn, willful people in the church. That's for sure. I'm enough. The difference between being a person of faith and a stubborn, willful person who's just capable of pushing through stuff is how much you submit to Jesus and how much you're just like, I'm going to get through it. I'm strong enough than this. I'm stronger than this. No, submit to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I'm not strong enough for this, but you are. You are. You don't have to like it. You don't have to enjoy it. You don't have to celebrate it, but you've got to submit to it. Faith isn't always pretty. Again, it's not a fantasy. Sometimes it has real rough edges. Sometimes it doesn't look good. But that's okay. Secondly, you can't base everything off of your feelings. Feelings are good. Feelings are great. Feelings should not drive the car, okay? Feelings can choose music on the radio. That's fine. Listen to what you feel like listening to. But do not live your life based on what you feel. The counselor and I were talking uh, about uh, lamenting. And uh, if you've ever read the Lament Psalms, which are found in the book of Psalms, the, the psalmist usually starts by writing out what he feels. Feel like this, don't like this. God, why are you abandoning me? God, why are you leaving me? Look at all how mean everybody is. I've been betrayed, blah, 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 blah. And then at some point, usually in the psalm, it turns to what the psalmist believes. But I know that you're good. I know that you're going to take care of me. I know that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I'll fear no evil. I, I, I know this, I know this, I know this. I would encourage you to try that exercise. Write down what you feel, but then write down what you believe and live your life out of what you believe. Sometimes what we believe and what we feel will line up. Sometimes it doesn't. And you've got to get your feelings into line. Thirdly, just because God is silent doesn't mean that you need to be, all right? Sometimes God is silent. And sometimes God is silent because there's a breach in our relationship. Sometimes there's sin in our life and God's like, I'm not talking to you until we're talking about this thing. Sometimes that happens. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You've got something floating around in your brain right now and they're like, yeah, it's kind of been going on. You deal with that. You confess and you repent and you work through that with the Lord. But sometimes, even after you're like, I can't like, I mean, I'm not perfect, but I can't put my finger on anything that's like, like, I feel like I should be good with the Lord. Like, it's just a spiritually dry time. Sometimes there is a legitimate season called the dark night of the soul. And I know that's super dramatic, but it was come up with in the Middle Ages. Somebody named it way back then. St. John of the Cross. Talk about a diva name right there. St. John of the Cross. But he went through as a very devoted follower of Christ and he went through seasons where it just felt like God wasn't there. And so sometimes we go through that. Sometimes you just go through seasons where God feels distant. There's a series of teachings on our website. You can go to the, our, 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 our webpage and then click on um, media. And I think it's classes. And there's a class there called the silent treatment. We do three sessions talking about this thing, this silence of God and what to do with it. If you're a book person, you can read Bruce Demarest's uh, Seasons of the Soul. It's an excellent book uh, about this dealing with God's silence. Uh, and then lastly, and this is really important, and I'm kind of circling back to something we've already said, but talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. If you're going through a hard time, if you're struggling, share with somebody what's going on. Talk to your connect group, small group, me. Come talk to me. I love talking to people. It's greatness. Let's do it. Find somebody to talk to. Your faith is not meant to be lived alone. Now, enduring opposition 
does imply that at some point, perhaps, we will overcome. So let's talk about how faith overcomes the opposition. Look at verse 27. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This woman's response to Jesus is absolutely brilliant. And here's why. He ex- she accepts the worldview that Jesus has painted for her. And she still argues for what she wants within it. She doesn't argue with him. She doesn't push back and say, no, 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 you don't have it right, Jesus. You know that it's the first century AD, Jesus. We don't call Gentiles dogs anymore. That's not okay. No, 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 no. That's not what she does. She accepts the worldview that Jesus has painted. And she argues from that. She says, even if, even if the Jews are the privileged children of God, and even if we are Gentile dogs, God still cares for his creation, which means God still cares for dogs. And they deserve his loving, tender kindness. And Jesus is like, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. This woman is brilliant. She's not offended by his comments. Maybe she is. She doesn't act out of it. She doesn't say, how dare you? Do you know who I am? She doesn't point out how unfair it is that Jesus' disciples completely dismissed her. She enters into a theological jousting match with Jesus, and she wins. And you know why she wins? It's not because she's smarter than Jesus. Heads up, no one is. It's because of her faith. It's because of her faith. Her faith is so great in in God's goodness and in who Jesus is as the Messiah. She accepts whatever comes out of Jesus' mouth, that's the truth. That's the way the world is. And if I see it any other way, I'm wrong. I'm the one that needs to adjust. And if you're sitting there being like, well, Travis, how do you know this? Look at what happens at the end of the story. Just look. Verse uh, 28, then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. You know what doesn't happen? She doesn't get like a, a guarantee from Jesus. She doesn't get like a little note that says, good for one demon casting out, you know, burn this in some incense and the demon will go away. She doesn't get a a receipt that if it doesn't work, you can bring it back and and Jesus will give you a full refund. She doesn't get anything. Jesus doesn't go with her to prove it. He doesn't tell her where he's going to be next so she can come back in case it doesn't work. She believes him and moves on. That's it. And what I love about her argument, I've never noticed it until this week, is what she has to say about the crumbs. The implication here is that the crumbs from the master's table are enough to satisfy the dogs. The crumbs, the leftovers, the spares, the afterthoughts, that's enough. And you see this again and again. I've never noticed it, but you see it again in the Gospels. Next week, we're going to talk about the Roman centurion. And he has a, a, a sick servant who's paralyzed. And he says, Jesus, heal my servant. And Jesus says, sure, I'll come with you. And he's like, no, 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 no. You just need to speak a word. Just say something and it'll happen. You don't have to come all the way. Remember the woman who was bleeding for a significant period of time. She just wanted to reach out and touch his robe. Not even his person, just his robe. I just need the crumbs. I just need the crumbs. If I can just touch him, I'll be okay. Last week, we talked about five loaves and two fish feeding 5,000 people. That is mere crumbs compared to what was required for that kind of a job. And Jesus did it because the crumbs of Jesus' power are more significant, are greater in strength than whatever opposition you encounter. Whatever obstacles you face, whatever doubts you have, the crumbs of Jesus' power, just just a finger is greater than anything you encounter. And this is where you have to land if you're gonna have to have faith that overcomes If you're going to triumph over your doubts and your fears and your worries, your faith is going to have to be something that's life-giving and sustainable. And the only way it can be that is if it accepts and if it trusts. It's got to accept and it's got to trust. First, the woman accepts Jesus' evaluation of her. 
She submits her upbringing, her morality, all of it to what Jesus has to say. And she doesn't do this in an unthinking manner. Jesus is, I mean, clearly that's not the case. This woman is clearly a smart woman. She's brilliant. She just understands that whatever Jesus says is right. And whatever I believe that's contrary to that, I've got to adjust. Look, if you find that Jesus agrees with everything you think and everything you believe, guess what? You're not Jesus' servant. He's yours. And it doesn't work like that. If there is nothing to which Jesus makes you feel uncomfortable, there's nothing in your life where you're like, oh, I don't know about that. If there's no way in your life that Jesus challenges you, then do you know him? There are things in the Bible that I don't like. I shared this last hour, I'll share it again. I believe that If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've trusted in him, you will go to heaven and spend eternity with God. If you don't believe that, I think you spend an eternity separated from God in hell. I believe that. I don't like it. I wish everybody would just go. I wish everybody would get to go to heaven, regardless. I would love to be a universalist. I just don't think the Bible teaches it. I don't think that's what God meant. So there's some things that You have to believe that maybe you don't like, and that's okay. You've got to submit your worldview to Jesus. You've got to say, Lord, teach me, instruct me, help me understand, because I don't like this right now. If you're going to follow Jesus, you don't always have to agree with him, but you do have to submit to him. And that's where the second part, that's where trusting comes in. Remember this woman believed in the crumbs of Jesus' power, that they were enough. She goes away without any proof. There will be times when you encounter obstacles and you'll be like, there is no way that God can overcome that. But you've got to trust in the crumbs, that even just the little crumbs are enough to overcome this. You've got to trust that his word is trustworthy. You've got to trust him. It's all you can do. And maybe at some point you'll understand. But there's no guarantee. There's no scripture that says, hey, when we die and go to heaven, Jesus is just going to have a a report card there. It's like, hey, this is why I did this. This is why I did this. This is why your dog Fluffy ran away. This is why that other dog that didn't look like Fluffy, but your parents said it was, came back. (laughs) God does not owe us an explanation. Sometimes when I tell my kids no, they'll be like, ah, but dad, why? And I'll explain to them. I'll be like, this is why, honey, you've had too much sugar today, clearly, because you're like literally bouncing off the walls. But other times, I will look at my child and I will say, the magic words, because I said so. (laughs) Oh, the intoxication you can feel with that level of power. (laughs) Probably not safe. She's, the oldest is five, almost six right now, and so it still works. I'm, I know there's a shelf life on because I said so. So I'm savoring it for as long as I can. But sometimes God looks at us, and we appeal to him, and we say, why? And he looks at us, and he says, because I said so. And it's not meant rudely. It's not meant callously. It's because sometimes we don't understand what God tells us until we trust him. You don't get to understand until you trust. Faith seeks understanding. Understanding doesn't always seek faith. And I know this because of the cross. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says in verse 22, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. What he's saying is the Jews want miracles. They want to prove to everybody that Jesus or that the Messiah is this powerful ruler. He's going to overthrow Rome. He's going to do all this stuff. They want power. And the Greeks want logic. They want their gods to make sense. They want the world to make sense. And then here's this stupid piece of wood, this cross that gets in the way of everything. The cross is offensive to any thinking person, to any spiritual person, because it doesn't make sense. You mean to tell me that Adam, who may or may not have existed, right? That's what some people think. He may or may not have existed. He ate a piece of fruit. Now we're all hosed. 
And God has to come, put on flesh, and die on a piece of wood 2,000 years ago. And if I say, yep, that's good enough for me. I, tr I trust that that's gonna, gonna be enough for God to accept me. If I say that, God accepts me as long as I don't count on anything that I do. You mean to tell me that that's how it works? That's ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't. Because it's foolishness. It's powerlessness. It doesn't make sense to us. But look at what it says. Keep reading. Verse 24, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It's not until you come to the cross that you see it for what it really is, the most beautiful thing in the world. It's the cross. And if I put my trust and my faith in this busted up piece of wood and in the person and work of Jesus Christ, what he did and who he is, if I can overcome that one barrier, then, then I can be like this woman. Then I can go away and I can trust that he's got me. Will you do that today? Some of you have never done that before. You have an opportunity today to say, I know, Lord, it sounds foolish, but for some reason today, I'm gonna give you my life. And for those of you who have done that before, thank God, but that's what the Christian life now is, taking every challenge, every obstacle, every barrier, and giving it to the Lord. Because real faith acknowledges the opposition, it endures it, it puts up with it, and then it eventually overcomes it by his strength, not ours.